Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast. It's been a while, but we're back with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. You might be watching us on YouTube. Uh, we have a new addition to the show. We've added the video element. Uh, I spent the summer building out a tiny little studio in my building um, so we can bring guests, so I can do the interviews physically in person, but also add the video element. I know some people don't want to listen to uh, me talk for two hours in audio only, um, and they like the visual element, so we decided that we wanted to add video, and it also allows us to cut up sort of snippets of the conversation um, to put out there and hopefully allow our work to spread a little bit further and wider than it currently does. So, yeah, if you if you do end up watching, uh, definitely let me, know, let me know what you think. I would love to hear any feedback you do have uh, on the added video element. Um, so, for the first one, uh, we actually have a uh, someone that's no longer involved with British basketball, ironically, um, but was a monumental figure for a very short period of time this summer. Um, he is Ed Warner. He comes from a big-time UK athletics background, but uh, ended up becoming the independent chair of the British Basketball Federation. Unfortunately, his uh, tenure only lasted seven weeks. Um, I'm sure many of you know that there was a lot of controversy around the GB program this summer, um, which you will hear about in this episode. Uh, so we wanted to you know bring him in and talk about it i felt like a lot of it's just been swept under the rug um and it needs to be spoken about more uh and kind of get a for us to get a better handle of exactly what happened and what went down and ultimately what led to his resignation and the resignation of the the rest of the independent independent directors from the board um so yeah, so we spoke for a long time. Uh, he was very open, uh, candid, and honest about the situation. So hopefully uh, you'll find it as interesting as I did. Before we get into the show, I need to do a sponsor message. Uh, this show is now sponsored by ourselves. Uh, we have a new Patreon account that was launched a couple of months ago at patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash hoopsfix. And what that is, it's a platform to allow creators uh, like ourselves um, get paid by our audience. You know, at the moment, the way the site works is uh, it's subsidized through our freelance work. We work with various different basketball organizations um, and teams on their digital content. But what we want to do is become 100% independent um, and allow us to go full time on Hoops Fix so that we can produce even more content um, and even a bigger contribution to the British basketball landscape. So what you can do is you can go to that site, you can sign up, um, you can uh, make a choice of donating as much or as little as you'd like every single month which basically goes directly to funding these shows, funding the the travel that we do uh, to various different games, to funding the writers, um, to write uh, content on the site, uh, all the social media posts, all the stuff that we're doing uh, every single day, and we have been for almost a decade now. Um, so we're coming to you directly to our audience, uh, asking if you value our work enough to be willing to um, put your money where your mouth is and essentially support us. So yeah, definitely check it out, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. And if you would be willing to donate what is essentially the price of a cup of coffee every single month to help support our work it will be forever appreciated um so yeah thank you anyway uh let's get into this week's show i don't want to ramble on for too long uh as always i uh, would love your feedback um drop me an email sam at hoopsfix.com or leave a comment on the site leave a comment on the youtube video um leave a comment on any of our social media profiles at hoopsfix uh let us know what you think we'd love to hear, hear back um and uh, Likewise, if you have any suggestions for future guests, um, definitely let me know. So, yeah, that is, uh, that's that's enough for me. Uh, here is our first episode in our brand new studio uh, with former BBF chair Ed Warner. Ed, welcome to the Who's Fix podcast in our brand new studio. First guest ever that we've had on the show. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm honoured, Sam. Thank you very much. So, obviously there's been a, a, been a lot going on. Uh, I think for people that don't know, we should start with kind of introducing yourself. Um, so, can you give a background of kind of who you are, um, where you came from, your involvement in the sport and what you're doing now? Goodness. So, I was for t 11 years almost the chair of UK Athletics, the governing body for the sport, track and field as the Americans call it here in the UK. And my swan song was two world championships in the Olympic Stadium last summer, uh, able-bodied and Paralympic. Uh, after that, I've done a few things in sport. For six months, I was the interim chair of British Equestrian, which was going through an independent inquiry into the circumstances surrounding the departure of their chief executive, which was all very controversial. So I went in and sort of steadied that ship. Um, I wrote a book called Sport Inc., which is all about the business of sport, which was published in the spring. And I then got a phone call um, asking me whether I'd step in and help out GB Basketball, which is where my rather lively seven weeks as the chair of GB Basketball comes in in the early summer. So, uh, you know, you said that you got a call kind of, you know, when you when you heard about the opportunity with British basketball, um, what was your perception of the sport before you got involved with it? What was your knowledge of it? 
Well, I've been quite gobby, which I'm used to being in sport about basketball uh, within well, the, the couple of years ahead of getting that call because I've been a passionate believer in every Olympic and Paralympic sport getting some lottery funding to enable them to put GB teams on court or to put GB athletes into competition. And we all know that basketball had lost out lottery funding post London 2012. There'd been a bit of a hokey cokey at being on funding, off funding. And I've been quite noisy. There was, a, there was an initiative called Every Sport Matters, which was launched in the summer of 2017, which basketball signed up to, where there was a call from a lot of unfunded sports to, for, to government to say, look, we need a core level of funding here to enable us to function as governing bodies. And, and that was my idea. So I corralled those sports. Basketball was one of them. Lisa Wainwright, the chief executive of uh, the BBF, was one of those people. So I, I've been in and around it a little bit. And... Other than that, I go all back to my school days where I, you know, we all played school basketball at school. I was rubbish but loved it because it didn't rain on you when you were uh, in the gym. Um, and you know, I watched the sport with a little bit of interest from the outside. I went to the, I was lucky enough to go to the Olympic final in Beijing, um, along with David Beckham. Although he was on the other side of the arena in the expensive seats, and I was right in the back row in the cheap ones. But um, it's a, it's a sport I kept an eye on. I can't say I knew anything about it from a government's perspective. But when I had the call, you know, for me, it's something that had great appeal as a, as a cause because here's a sport that we all know is very diverse um, that's a euphemism for lots of things that we, I think we all understand um, very very popular all the way up to kids looking up to the NBA and I thought very deserving because for me you need if you're a youngster playing any sport to believe that one day you could pull on a British vest you might one day be performing at the pinnacle of that sport globally and Although it's never nailed on, never guaranteed, it's you know, a steep mountain to climb, you've got to make sure there is that opportunity and basketball was missing it. And there was a chance for me, possibly, to help it out of a hole. You know, you said there that you were sort of one of the biggest advocates of, of funding for all um, from UK sport. And you've obviously been very vocally critical of them in the past uh, for their sort of no compromise, medals only approach. When you looked across all the sports, uh, did you feel that actually basketball was probably the most hard done by out of all of them? No, one of a couple. Um, the one that really, really got my goat when it was chopped from funding was wheelchair rugby. And the reason for that was, was, I mean, it's really about the life chances that people playing wheelchair rugby have. Often you've got people with very severe spinal injuries. They're on benefits if they're not able to be funded to play the sport. And for me, that was a sort of a real cause of passion and frankly the British team at the time was fifth in the world they've now sneaked up to fourth in the world they're still not funded uh, and I can't say that British basketball was fourth in the world so if it comes to proximity to the podium basketball wasn't there but if you look at breadth of appeal um, the lack of opportunity versus the number of kids playing the sport and engaging with it then sure it was hugely deserving and some of those other sports in that every sports matters initiative I like them, I like the people running them, but they don't sports that get close to my heart. Uh, basketball got close to my heart simply because of its, um, it, I say, the diversity of, of, of fan base and, and, and participants. And I, I, I'll make you a comparison. One of the other things I do in sport is I chair the foundation of Crystal Palace Football Club. It happens to be the team I love, uh, but one of the things I love about the work they do is it's in a very deprived corner of London, down in South East London, um, some of the most uh, needy parts of the London community and we do fantastic things, um, anti-gang, uh, anti-knife crime, mental health amongst youngsters and it's not a different uh, demographic really that basketball plays to in, in the inner cities of the UK and um, you know for me that's something worth supporting and um, people use the jargon of a pathway but um, let's use that jargon, I wanted to see there was a pathway from the school gym or the, or, the, or the back street playground and a hoop all the way through to a British team. And if there's anything I could do to make that happen in a crisis, and it was a crisis earlier this year, then I was happy to, to step up. I had the time and um, I've got sharp elbows. One of the things uh, I did see you say in an interview when, when you were considering the position is you spoke to a few people and, and basically people warned you off of, of getting involved with basketball and said it's very political. Um, what were people saying to you? What was kind of the word on the street about basketball when you were kind of doing your due diligence and working out whether or not it was a position you should accept? Well, look, let, let's name a name of one of the journalists who we know is you know, big in the basketball community, Mark Woods. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm allowed to mention a competitor's name here. Fact, I just of course, have. no, no, um, my work. Mark, Mark's other sport that he really writes about is athletics. So I knew Mark very well and had done for 10 years. Um, yeah, Mark's view was, yeah, this has always been a deeply political environment and many people have tried and many have failed. He wasn't discouraging me from doing it, but he was making it clear to me how, uh, how tough the task was. But the conversation I had, which was most revealing really, and I dug in and ignored it, was from the chair of Sport England. So Nick Cattell, who again, I know well, he's chief executive of the London Marathon. So think about the, the crossover to athletics. I'd known Nick for, for 10 years. And I went to see him to say, I'd had this call, there was this opportunity, what did he think? And he gave me very, very clear advice not to do it. And we'll come, I'm sure, to Sport England later, but when I went to see Nick after I'd finished um, to have a few words about basketball England, he said, well, I did tell you not to do it. And the reason Nick was telling me not to do it was that yeah, he thought the structure was broken and he thought that folding GB basketball into England was the way to go. It might be the way to go, uh, but not with the people running basketball England that we have at the moment. And so I've, I've, I've had that sort of clear the air discussion with Nick subsequently, but he was just warning me that this was very tricky. And when there is no money, these things are very tricky because you suddenly are relying on volunteers to give it their time, love and attention. And in this particular sport, you're dealing with professional athletes in the players that are typically playing outside of the UK, but are coming together to play for a GB team. And so the collision of an amateur approach with a professional playing staff is it could be quite ugly and, and so it proved in a way with the players very very upset with the lack of support they were getting so I, I guess my eyes were open they but they could never have been as open as they had to be um, to really understand the people that I had to deal with not in the BBF who I found yeah, a tiny staff of very very devoted um, hard-working passionate people and a board of really excellent people but the people we had to deal with in the home countries who yeah, just made it hideously difficult to to try and find a way forward. So to give the lay of the land to people when you took the role, um, you know, British Basel was in a situation where they basically run, basically had run out of money. Um, you know, you'd said uh, there was the initial report before you were confirmed that you'd only take the role if uh, Basel was given a certain amount of funding to be able to see them through that period. Um, and also an internal review was taken of the sport. Uh, can you explain to people exactly where the sport was, where British basketball was when you came into the position? Well, it was staring down the barrel of bankruptcy. Um, it was running out of money and didn't have sufficient funds to put teams on court in the summer. And the government had put this lifeline out there of up to half a million pounds, but dependent upon the government situation being sorted. And, and I have to say, coming in, you would have assumed that getting together the home countries in any sport and the British Federation uh, to find a collective solution when the government's put a lifeline out there would be, if not easy, that, but everybody would be on the same side and wanting to make it work. Um, so for me, it looked like the, the building blocks were in place to get through the summer, to revise the structure and the relationships between all the different bodies and to then kick on to this winter that we're going into now and then uh, next summer season. And the really shocking thing was people just couldn't get on side. Um, the deep-seated animosity um, shown towards the British Basketball Federation by the home countries was, was quite shocking, really. And I'll tell you what was most shocking about it, Sam, was uh, I'm used to, in athletics, I've had any number of rows for a decade with people. The one I've always found is they've been passionate about the sports. So people come het up, angry, um, cross, disagreeing with you because they had a real deep-seated love of track and field and they, they wanted you to see it their way but you could have a ding dong um, they may you may have to agree to disagree but people came into the room all with the same shared passion they just had a different perspective on, on the solutions what I found in basketball was that a lot of people in the room who I don't think actually cared very much about basketball that was shocking for me that you had people who had the future of basketball in their hands who yeah, if I'm to believe what I hear you yeah, weren't often seen courtside and again, one of the great perks of running a national governing body is, you know, you get good seats. In basketball terms, you get to sit in the front row. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know I, would, I took a lot of nonsense in athletics and I loved it. And sometimes I lost sleep over it. Sometimes I grew more gray hairs over it. But hey, one of the perks is I've got to be on the finish line at major championships cheering on British athletes. Um, so there is an upside and a downside to all these things. And you give these jobs their labors of love in basketball terms it's an unpaid volunteer role but 
you'd expect people in the room having a row about structures actually to be lovers of basketball and I didn't find that and that was quite a surprise to me because it meant it was difficult to appeal to people's real sense of the importance of a British vest in basketball and if, if people don't get that then actually it's going to be very hard to find compromises because you're not all coming at it thinking I want British basketball to succeed. I was, I, was, I was dealing with people who seemed to want their own corner of basketball to succeed for reasons which weren't to do with the sport, whether, to do with, whether it's to do with power or influence or status or, or whatever, or just because they liked a battle, because they were stubborn in fights, because you know, they wanted their own way, whatever it was. But um, I didn't get that collective passion for the sport, which I think would be a real surprise to your average fan, your average player at any level. Um, that the people presiding over their sport actually you know, weren't passionate about it. They don't, basketball doesn't have to be their first sport, it's not my first sport, but you've got to be, you've got to want to get excited, you've got to, got to want the invite, you've got to want to be there and, 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 and see the team on. And I wasn't, I wasn't finding that, which, which was really disappointing. Do you think, like, I mean, when I've, whenever I've looked at it, I've always said that, I basically think the problem is that the BBF is a separate organisation. It's the fact that there is this just two completely, well, I say two, there's four completely separate entities um, that then they see it as us versus them, even though ironically it was the home nations that wanted to set up the BBF in the first place, and then it's become this kind of political warfare. Don't you think that uh, actually just by combining them all into one, uh, under one banner, uh, would be the easiest way of moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. Um, You have, in all sport, you've got the Scotland and Wales issues where they don't want to be little brother or sister to England. And look, England's, I'm going to get the math slightly wrong, but it's roughly 85% of the population of Great Britain. And yeah, hence the Wales and Scotland would always feel small physically by comparison. Interestingly, Claire Wardle, um, of whom I'm sure we'll have more words later, um, said to me very early on, before I even took the job, but of course, Ed, we've got to deal with the Scottish problem. Well, had I turned around to David Davis, who's the chair of Scotland, and said, you know, Claire Ward was describing you as the Scottish problem, he'd have probably been apoplectic. And I was, you know, I didn't do that because I'm I tried to build consensus, not to sort of blow people apart. Um, so I think it's always difficult to get Scotland and Wales in. And lots of sports, it's England and GB that are combined. So triathlon would be a good example of that. Hockey would be another good example. Cycling are a good example. It can, can, as long as you've got the 85% of the population bound in, it, it can be arranged. But the issue is, Who's going to run it and how are they going to run it and are they fit for purpose? Um, are they really good enough to do the combined job, let alone one or other of the jobs? And my, my observation in basketball would be that the leadership in basketball in England is not fit to own British teams, period. Structurally, absolutely they could. I can understand why Nick Fitella Sport England would say, don't take the job, Ed, because the right thing is that it becomes part of basketball England structurally. I can get all of that. When I then met the Basketball England people, having taken it on, slightly to thumb my nose at Nick, because he was sort of trying to steer me away, and I'm wondering why he's trying to do that. Um, When I met them, um, I'm instantly thinking, oh my God, um, are you really going to hand the keys of the British team um, to this organisation, which looks to me to be pretty dysfunctional? And that is what's happened. And I think that's the shame. Scotland and Wales, uh, Scotland and Wales, Wales has got no money. It's tiny in basketball terms. Scotland's nearly bust. Um, the big fight we had um, which led to the resignation of the whole board of BBF led by me when um, rather precipitously the home countries called the general meeting and uh, to change the articles of association actually subsequently we've seen the Basketball Scotland accounts have been published and they're out of cash they've got a sliver of money left and, and I can see now that they were desperate to have nothing to do with GB at that stage because even if they had to spend a penny on British basketball um, it could have tipped them the wrong side of, of insolvency. So um, Scotland is small. The answer is England. But the answer has got to be England in the right structure with the right people. And, these, and I think they haven't got to be basketball people, but they've got to be people who really care about basketball, the sport. So um, you came in, you knew you were on an interim basis. Uh, do you know, like, did, was that a three-month term, six-month term? Did you know roughly how it was going to be, or was it just... I can't, I can't remember. I think, it, I think we might have said three months. It didn't really matter, because these interim things, they either extend or they get done, because you've done the job. So a good example would be a question, which it took me six months from beginning to end to do what had to be done there, to leave them with a new permanent chair, a new permanent chief executive, three new non-executive directors, 
um, stabilised a, a, a sport that was squabbling with itself. And I'll give you, it's not a bad parallel. So in a question, it's not England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, you know, GB um, at each other's throats. It can be show jumping, dressage, three day eventing, yeah, and, and there's lots of other disciplines in the question as well. And, and there was lots of tension between the different disciplines. Show jumping is an incredibly wealthy sport. Um, some of the other disciplines are less wealthy, and, and, and GB didn't have a lot of cash. Um, I managed to stabilize that, it took six months. Had it taken nine months, it would have taken nine. Had it taken three or four, it would have taken three or four. So, in basketball terms, let's get in, stabilize it, sort it, get the funding right, find some commercial deals. And it might have become permanent. You know, people might have fallen in love with me. Uh, crazy to believe they might have done. They might have done. Um, they might have asked me to stay longer. Who knows? But you know, I, I had. I do most of my work. I do in the city. It's nothing to do with sport. The sport stuff I do, I tend to do because I feel passionate about it. And I'd have done it for as long as as was necessary. As it was, it was seven weeks. So it's the shortest appointment almost you could you could imagine. But um, you can only work anywhere if you feel you can get the job done. And in this instance, it was an absolute brick wall of intransigence and poor behaviour from the home countries and, and actually the board resigning en masse was the right thing to do to publicise just what shocking behaviour was going on uh, because the basketball community needed to know that. We'll get on to that about whether or not it was the right thing to do because I've got a couple of thoughts around it that I'd like to ask you about but um, let's let's talk about the let's talk about the ambush. Yeah. Uh, so, so to give people the background um, there was half a million pounds, 195,000 was given uh, immediately to complete the upcoming windows. Yep. There was 305,000 that was ring fenced on the condition that uh, the BBF with the home nations came to some sort of agreement a on plan. Yeah. a plan of how the sport was going to move forward. Yeah. Um, and that was where between all sides, no <coughs> agreement could be made. So how long uh, were you in negotiations for? How many meetings took place? Um, Kind of was there any progress, or was it just a case of you know were you first drawing up a proposal, taking it to them, they were rejecting it? Were they drawing up a proposal coming to you? Like how did the process work? They, they had a proposal that was on the table from the off, going way back before my time, um, that basically shut up shop for the BBF. I mean, as, as good as shut it up, um, and rolled everything in to Manchester under Basketball England. And I took a look at that, and some of my board colleagues have been around longer; they'd already been working on it. Um, and it seemed that might have been the right answer with the right people and the right financial structures, but it seemed all wrong with the people that were in place in Basketball England um, and the structures that they were proposing. So what we did was we looked at a plan that involved a couple of key elements, um, three key elements really. Uh, one would be leaning very heavily on the league um, for partly some personnel resource, you know, so sort of working with them, moving into their offices in Leicester, save some costs that way. Um, using some of their, um, the league team's coaching support to support British teams. Um, a commercial initiative across the whole sport, including the league, so we would go out into the marketplace and sell sponsorship rights for basketball in Great Britain at all levels to, to major sponsors. Um, and the third, which was the most contentious for the home countries, was some membership fee from the three home countries into Great Britain. Any other sport you look at in the UK, um, the centre, Britain, British teams are in part funded by grassroots members. A little bit of their membership fee flows up to the centre to put British teams, in this case, on court or on track in athletics or you know, whatever, whatever the sport might be. And um, I can't remember exactly the number we were proposing. It was a relatively modest sum per person. And that got violent rejections from England, Scotland and Wales. Even though when you look at the Articles of Association of the, the, of, of the BBF, it's got the right in there to charge a fee to the members, and the members are England, Scotland and Wales. And then in turn, they'll be their own ultimate members. Um, so I see Claire Wardle in an interview that she gave the other week, um, was saying we can't go asking our members for the price of two cappuccinos because they don't drink cappuccino. Well, firstly, I think that's monumentally patronising. Um, well, yeah, so let's say, what, what are two cappuccinos? It's a fiver. Um, that's the sort of number we were talking about. But it, you don't equate it to two cappuccinos. Um, it's, does the average person who's a member of a basketball club who's playing basketball and wants to be a member of Basketball England, Scotland or Wales, 
think that having GB teams that are well organized, well funded, have a chance on an eight to 12 year view of rising up the global rankings and doing the nation round, is it worth a fiver a year? Yes or no? Um, go and ask them. And my guess is actually most would say, well, yeah, actually, I, I get that. It is, I want it to be a harmonious whole that I can be a part of. But that was violently, aggressively rejected. And that was quite a surprise to me because it was a sort of well-costed, well-organized, well-structured proposal that involved us all being together. I'll give you an example. Um, we invited the three chairs of England, Scotland and Wales to come onto the board of the BBF. So to use a horrible city term, they had skin in the game. So they were in it with us together. They all refused. The reason they refused, because we can't take personal risks with our reputation by being in an organization that might ultimately go bust. Well, hang on a minute, I've joined, you know. All the other board members, many of whom had only recently joined the BBF, have got professional reputations in different walks of life. They've joined, they're all in this, we're all trying together to make it work, but those three chairs wouldn't do it. And I see even now, they've taken control of the BBF. The three chairs of England, Scotland, Wales aren't on the board of the BBF. What are they scared of? Come on, make it work, get in there, get some skin in the game. Pull your own members together for the good of Great Britain. You know, do we care about British teams on court? Being well funded, well supported, well organized, or do actually you want them to arrive at Gatwick Airport, meet the day before the match, meet each other in the hotel, um, introduce yourselves to each other, get out there without practice and play, lose, and go back to Spain or Croatia or wherever else they might be playing, and, and they're going to feel proud about that. Next time you put the call in, are they going to want to turn up? Probably not. So your British team, it becomes a vicious circle, and, and that's what we're staring down the barrel of. And, and all I was looking to do was to jump those three organisations into bed with us, however you then structure it, whether it's BBF as part of Basketball England or vice versa, it doesn't really matter, but are we all in this together? And they refuse to be in it together with us, and I think that's very sad. Normally, uh, well, my understanding is that normally chairs are not so hands-on, um, and it, it always struck me as a bit odd that it was always the chairs that were negotiating all of this, and the CEOs weren't doing it. Obviously, you know, Wardle's not full time. I'm assuming you were full time while you were interim, like not full time, but it was a big. Yeah, it was a big project. Big chunk of my life, yeah, so. <laughs> um, I'll never get it back. But it was. Uh, yeah, it was so, a laugh. yeah. So, so, <laughs> like, why, why was it the chairs that were doing the negotiation? What, why weren't the CEOs doing that? I think Wales, Wales has, I, from my memory, you may correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think it's even got any full full time yeah, staff. Yeah, yeah. Wales so, is so, a so we're talking unique Scotland situation. Yeah. Um, David Davis and Claire Wardle are very dominant characters in their own different ways. And they've got two um, chief executives, but again, very different people who, you know, when the chair says jump, they ask how high. I mean, I think they're very much under the thumb of their two chairs. And, um, and yet, both David and Claire were doing this part time. And so there were times in which you'd be told, well, we can't have a call or we can't get hold of them because they're traveling in Europe or they're at an offsite for Coca-Cola somewhere strange. Um, and I think in an emergency situation in which yeah, time was of the essence, uh, we didn't get the best of basketball in England, basketball Scotland because the chairs were so dominant in the, in the decision making. And I think those chief executives are in many ways sort of operational heads. They're not true leaders of the sport um, and maybe that's a function of Scotland being very small and maybe for England it's a function of um, you know, people tell me Stuart's had some illnesses down the months in the last couple of years been absent quite a lot and Claire's quite a dominant character so it, it was a function of the people maybe rather than the structures Were any questions asked on that? Because I mean the same with GB like why is Lisa doing it and not you? Oh Lisa was heavily involved in it I was the spokesperson if you like so I was the sort of battering ram externally but Lisa, but Lisa was a 24-7 woman um, in this and I think if you look at the half million pounds, that lifeline that's got the GB teams through this year, um, without Lisa Wainwright, that would never have happened. And the cred she's got insufficient credit in the sport for really putting her personal reputation on the line to make that happen. I mean, she shook some cages. She probably wound up Sport England in particular quite substantially to a, a former employer of hers um, to get that money over the line. Um, she called out. Uh, DCMS, so the sports minister, to make it happen, and she made it happen. And I think she was a force of nature in that. So um, she was the one who put the call into me, asking me to go into chair it. I'd come across her during the Every Sport Matters initiative, um, and I thought we were, for a very brief period, quite a good double act. In that, you know, she was working her socks off behind the scenes, and I was prepared to put my head above the parapet and, and make those big calls because I've, yeah, you know, I've got a public persona in sport, and you know, journalists will, national journalists will listen to me, and they did during that time. 
um, and I can put a call into high levels of DCMS for England UK sport and, and did do um, so it's the way it worked but I, I, I saw Lisa burning the midnight oil for some time and it wasn't about you know, protecting her own position saving her job you know, this is a woman who played basketball when younger loves the sport um, cares passionately about it and is a is, 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 was a real believer in the, in the GB initiative so in these meetings let's let's get to the yeah. takeover stuff uh, the you coup. know the coup um, you know you you guys went into a meeting with with the uh, interpretation that it was going to be continuing the negotiations of how this money was going to be spent I, and coming I, together I, a joint I plan. I called the meeting, Sam, because um, we had a plan. We revised the plan to reflect some of their feedback, sent it to them in advance of the meeting and had a meeting scheduled with um, Claire Wardle was offered a hospital appointment or something. We always knew she wasn't going to be there with, with Scotland and Wales. Um, and it was all fixed for a meeting in the city in which we were going to talk about the detail of the plan to try and thrash out a solution. And five minutes before the meeting, um, David Davis said, could I have a word? It took me outside before we formally began the meeting and said, I did, just you ought to know that um, the members have called the general meeting in half an hour's time um, at the West End in Claire Wardle's office. Uh, well, I thought she had a hospital appointment, but anyway, she was in her office at the West End. Um, I said, well, that's quite interesting. I thought we were about to um, debate the plan. Well, no, we're not. Yeah, we've called a general meeting. There's no point having this meeting. So I went back into the room with them, told my board colleagues, the situation we were all completely flabbergasted um, it was Ill illegal and I'll tell you why it's illegal because you can't call an EGM if you owe the BBF some money and, and both Scotland and England had outstanding invoices they hadn't paid we made that clear to them they said well, we don't care anyway and the oh so the only thing that happened was the meeting was I can't remember it was delayed by 30 minutes or an hour now but because we were sitting there chatting about it so well, if no one could get to the West End now you know how got a helicopter got a helipad um, so they pushed it back a little bit um, and they basically said well you can come with us if you want to but we're having the meeting and these are the changes we're putting in place and the change that was really stood out for me was they, re they removed the power of the BBF to charge a membership fee to England, Scotland and Wales so the one contentious thing about us saying we're all going to be in this together we're going to have to find some money for GB teams England, Scotland and Wales need to chip in they put a line through it uh, by taking that power out of the articles and so we all sat round as, as a board and looked at each other and said, well, this can't be right. Um, yeah, w what do we do? Um, if we fight it on illegality, if we ask them to pay those invoices, all they'll do is call one for tomorrow. So it's going to happen, come what may. Better we make a statement, a very clear statement to the, the basketball community that this nonsense is going on, um, which we did. And at the time, uh, one of the things which really stood out from a basketball community perspective was their plan was taking the under 20s off court now i see they've since rode back on that and they've entered the team goodness knows where they got the money from maybe they're going to put some membership fees up i don't know um but we were sitting there thinking this has to be wrong for the sport how can you how can you take an age group team out just to save a couple of quid when you're not prepared to what do they call it you know spend the price of a couple of cappuccinos per member on some membership fees and it was all very illogical and that to me i said to you earlier it didn't feel to me like these people really actually loved basketball as opposed to loving the politics or seeing it as a game in itself, this sort of shenanigans. Um, and for the team to suffer or for the other 20s to suffer in that way at that time struck me as completely wrong. If the meeting was unconstitutional, uh, how has everything still stood? Like, and why, you know, from, from my standpoint, I'm like, everyone's resigned. Now you don't even have a seat at the table to carry on fighting it. And it's just being kind of let slide, like you know, no one's talking about it anymore. It's just kind of it's just happened, um, you know. And they've they Claire's since come out and said actually that wasn't the case, and uh, the meeting was perfectly constitutional. I can't remember the exact quote. Um, it's yeah, it's huge. Yeah, um, that's that's just complete nonsense. But it's there's just no point arguing that case with her because they could have made it constitutional by paying the invoices, and then you know they could have called the meeting. So the point was they were going to call a meeting at some point imminently to basically change the articles of, of the BBF. And so they, they would have, had they, had we gone along to the general meeting, watched them change the articles, they'd have had us out. They loathed us because we were calling them to account. Um, so why, why have things not changed? Um, why are they all letting it slide? Because I just don't think they care enough. And they've been sloppy about so many things. So for example, um, they wanted to put Sir Rodney Walker on the board um, as a director, but the 
You can't do that because he is the chairman of the licensed league. So the BBF gives a license to the league and then they were suddenly going to allow their chairman to sit on the board and make decisions about his own license. Um, but they were just bulldozing through all of these things. And I think these were people who were busy, didn't care enough, um, doing it on the fly, at the edges. Scotland was short of money. Um, Claire, for whatever reason, wanted to take control. And I don't think they've shown anywhere near enough care and attention since they took control. The board, last I looked at the, I was the company's house register yesterday, knowing I was coming to talk to you today. Um, looked at the website of the BBF, and I think there's four directors at the moment. There's Nikki Shaw representing England. Um, we'll talk about whether she's going to become the general secretary or not in a minute. Whether they've advertised that job, don't think they have. Um, Steph Collins, fantastic, um, in there represent Wales, and two non-execs. Um, a four-person board running British basketball. You know, where is Scotland in all of that? No representative. Where are the three chairs of England, Scotland, and Wales? Not there. Um, they still haven't got a general secretary. They haven't even advertised it. If it's going to be Nicky Shaw, what then happens to England? All that stuff's up in the air, and it's now October, and they took control in late July. So what have they been doing for three months? Morris Watkins is, is now the chair. Company's house doesn't have him listed yet. Um, I think when I looked at the website, he's not on it. Um, the last news item on the website was about six weeks ago. Um, it, it's an insult to the sport. It's an insult to the team. It's an insult to the fans. Um, it's really simple, basic stuff. And, and I think that England just doesn't have, at the moment, leadership that will make these things happen. And when I, I was told all the way along, please don't bother Stuart Kelly with the, the British stuff. So I didn't. I had to do everything with Claire because we were told just deal with Claire. Okay, so who's dealing with the British stuff now? Why aren't there news items? Why isn't the website up to date? Why haven't they got all the directors listed? Why aren't there enough directors? Um, all these things have fallen through the cracks. And I just wonder where, where is Sport England on this now? Where's DCMS? Are they happy their money's being spent in this cavalier fashion? Um, how do we know that British teams will have enough money behind them next year? What's the solution to that been? Has someone found a little bit of extra money they've not told anybody about? Has someone it plastered over the cracks at DCMS and said, don't tell anybody, but here's another couple of quid, you can put an under-20s team out there. I just don't know, we should be told. And Yeah, I mean, that, that's the a question there is like, you know, if the, if the meeting was un unconstitutional um, and so therefore shouldn't stand, surely that is some sort of violation of Sporting England's governance code. Um, why has there been no intervention from Sporting England or UK Sport? You know, Phil Smith has said that he, they've investigated multiple accusations from obviously board members that have left Barcelona, England, um, as well as uh, GB, and they found no evidence of, of wrongdoings, just uh, poor communication on their part. Well, that is, that is complete tosh. Um, I went with Nick Humby, former chair of BBS, I think he was two ahead of me, um, to go to see Sport England, to see Nick Patel, the chairman, at my request. I said, look, I've got some concerns about the governance of the sport, particularly Basketball England, I want to lay them out to you. And one of the great accusations against Sports England is that they've been complicit in supporting Claire Wardle and Stuart Kelly and not investigating them properly. And Phil Smith, who's head of sport for Sport England, is the relationship manager for basketball, so it's sort of on his watch. And I turned up at the meeting with Nick and found Phil there as well. Well, actually, I'd have spent some of the meeting talking about Phil's relationship with basketball because that's one of the accusations that's out there in the sport. Um, but anyway, Phil's in the room. So we talked it through and I said, look, there's five people you need to talk to who will give you chapter and verse on governance failings in Basketball England. So who are they? So I listed the five. They said, oh, thank you very much. We'll have a look at that. And later that day, one of those five people rang me to say, I, I hear you gave Phil Smith my name because um, he rang me to ask me about governance in Basketball England. And I knew what this individual's concerns were. I said, okay, did you go through all the stuff with Phil? And he said, well, it was a very strange call because it was, it was going to be a really short call. And I hadn't, he hadn't asked me about any of the things that I thought really mattered. So at the end of the call, I said, but Phil, are you not going to ask me the following questions? And I gave him all the questions he should ask me. So I then gave him the answers to the questions he should ask me. He said, I was very unimpressed. Uh, and off yeah, at the end of the call. And I know Phil called other people. Anyway, I had an email from Phil the other day. I, I warned him that I was going to be coming to, I didn't say it was with you, but I was going to be having a, a media discussion about basketball. And he said, yeah, please don't do anything to... Um, increase the turmoil in the sport but if you feel you've got to say stuff to the media do say it well what I would say is that to my mind Sporting to mark their own homework here in that um, 
the person who's the relationship manager for basketball rang the five people whose names I gave him um, to ask about governance in Basketball England. Well, what's independent about that? They didn't even ask somebody else in the organisation who had nothing to do with basketball to make those calls. They left it to the basketball man to call about basketball. Well, one of the big accusations in the sport is that Sport England have got too cosy with the leadership of Basketball England, haven't held them to account, haven't properly investigated. So I would say, I can't have any faith in that investigation. There was no independence. I'm not even saying, ideally it should have been someone from outside Sport England, but even if it was someone inside Sport England, it's a huge organisation, find somebody who's never had anything to do with basketball, insulate them, let them make the calls. But if you leave it to the relationship manager to call and say, got any problems with Basketball England's governance, um, how can you be sure that they've probably been acted upon? So I know all those people had a call. I know some of them have got very serious accusations to make about how things were conducted. And I'm told, well, yeah, we've all been told there's nothing to see here, move on. Well, that is marking your own homework. And yeah, in all walks of life, that's not what you do. So if Sport England, um, you know, in your view, aren't, aren't holding them to account, uh, whose job is it to hold Sport England to account? Like, what's the next step above that? Well, it's DCMS, it has to be. Um, and, you know, Nick Vitale reports to the sports minister. So that's the chain of command. And it's the sports minister who came up with a half million quid. So they need to satisfy themselves all up and down the line that the organisation that's been in receipt of that funding and if there's any future funding to come is fit for purpose. And a really trivial example, Sam, um, under the Sports Governance Code, you are supposed to be posting your minutes of your meetings online uh, so that you know, all interested stakeholders have a chance to have a look at them. Now, you know, I've been a party to how those minutes get drafted. If there's something massively con controversial and sensitive, of course they get redacted or you, know, you get a euphemistic sentence in there saying, you know, we discussed the role of the chief executive and that's all it says. And you might have had a half hour discussion, but you can't put all that out there. I understand that. But there just aren't minutes on the, on the website. So the really simple stuff that says, if you're going to make the governance code requirements, you do these things. This is how you choose directors. This is how you advertise the roles. This is, and, 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 and. I don't believe has been happening and there have been some very disgruntled, you've probably spoken to them privately, um, I can think of three former directors of Basketball England who you know, are up in arms about the way they were treated on the board in terms of you know, being treated like mushrooms, um, if you like, and kept in the dark and, and in the end all have left the board frustrated. Um, a former member of staff at, at Basketball England has some very punchy things to say to me, you know, I gave their name, Sport England as well. I, I just don't know how all these things can be swept. So it can't be just about poor communication. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, the, the minutes actually have been have since been put online. Uh, I did a lot of chasing <laughs> to try and get them, um, but they are online. But from what I'm aware, that they are sort of very heavily redacted. Yeah, and months, months, months late. Yeah, and months, months, months. And, and you know, who's to say they're even accurate records now because they're so yeah. far off the time. And yeah, one, yeah, they were one of the one of the really testy moments, which I think um, you know, websites including yours have talked about down the months was um, you know, pretty um, forensic discussions about the capabilities of the chief executive going back um, at Basketball England that you know, former board members are just really cross that minutes didn't reflect how the conversations actually went, no action was taken. Um, it feels quite autocratic and again I just don't think that's it's not in the interest of the sport. I mean in, in all walks of life you get differences of opinion, absolutely. But you've got to open yourself up to that debate, be seen to handle it um, rationally, transparently, fairly. There'll be conclusions. Not everyone will be happy with all the conclusions, but at least they should be able to go away saying, you know, I had a chance to air my view. I can understand. I'm going to have to say, OK, fair dues. I will agree to disagree on this one. But there seems to be no process of debate which would lead to people being comfortable that they could agree to disagree things were closed down or brushed aside for sure i think the complete disregard for the media or the the small amount of media that exists um has been very frustrating on, on my part for sure uh obviously you know we I spoke to you about doing a, a sort of live panel with you and the home nations and you very agreed to it, it. Yeah, yeah no problem and and uh, and they turned it down and obviously claire hasn't spoken publicly to any media apart from the press association interview that she did last month um other than that it's all been statements that are very well polished and pr proofed um and I actually think that, you know, for me, like in the run up to the whole thing, 
it was pretty even. I could see why the home nations kicked back on certain things in the, in the BBF's proposals, um, but I could also see where you were coming from as well. Uh, until the hostile takeover, uh, which I think just shows a complete lack of um, moral integrity uh, and not what I would want to see from leaders of our sport representing, you know, the members. Um, at that point, I think and things that, took and, a. And, and, and let's remember, Sam. I mean, you said all those things, not me. But hey, um, I might agree with you. Um, that came close on the heels of the players being so upset after that match up in Glasgow, um, the statement that they made, and and so much of what went on at the time seemed to me to be, show a disregard for the team and the teams. Yeah. Um, which is just wrong, I and mean, no one responded to their comments. Yeah. Um, in the home countries who are the ones being called out there yeah um, yeah they made some they made a very bold statement about what they required um, and what they were looking for and yeah who stepped up to, to, to talk to them about that to answer those accusations and I think yeah do you, we want them playing for us yeah we can't take them for granted you know on, on that note you know obviously there is a a historied um, record of, of players actually being very disgruntled with the BBF and mm. GB in terms of uh, lack of communication, the way things are run, or rather a lack of professionalism. Um, and even then, you know, looking at looking at the plan that you put forward uh, when you were negotiating with with the home nations, there was stuff in there which I still felt. Um, again, if we're going to talk about caring for the sport, it's like how can we have a CEO on close to six figures? And we're still asking players for contributions, you know, uh, and that was from both sides, not not just the BBF, it was the home nations as well. Like, um, you know, when you look at that, especially when, you know, you look at the BBF, you've got a CEO on close to six figures, then we've got a CEO of the, of the Scotland and a CEO of Wales that are both taking relatively well, not, good salaries. Not Wales, but yes. Sorry, it, Scotland it, and England, it, sorry, yeah. Scotland and England. Um, you know, where do you sit on that uh, in terms of, you know, payment of staff, administration costs? They were relatively high in, in your plan. Um, did you not, believe that there was a way that you could you know potentially cut the ceo have uh met representatives from from the home nations on a as a collective head of the bbf to make it more of a, a group together thing rather than separate entities i think all those are completely achievable um provided you've got the right people that can do the job um to the right standard um we did hack right back on the cost i can't remember what um the total salary bill was a couple hundred grand i think across all staff at the bbf in the end um, and look, the going rate for a chief executive of a modest-sized governing body, which this is, is in the sort of 60 to 100 range. If you just look across all the sports in the UK, thousands of pounds a year. Um, I don't think you could do it on a volunteer basis um, and do right by the sport and build the platform. And the platform is largely about commercial income, so you need somebody who can get out there and shake the tree. But you absolutely can do it in conjunction with the home nations you absolutely can so all the way along for me it wasn't about not wanting to do it with england which is 85 percent of the uk as we said earlier yeah. um it's about could you do it with those people and i think we're already seeing that you can't because gb is suffering as a basketball brand let's hope the teams don't suffer on court but i have a fear that they won't have the requisite support to succeed over time and what's succeeding over time for me is on a four, eight, 12 year view that Britain's success improves at senior level. Age groups are already showing a lot of green shoots. Um, how do you nurture that? How do you build on age group success and carry it through to senior level, which is fiercely competitive, we know. How many slots does Europe have in the Olympic qualifications? Not many, and there's some great nations out there. So you've got to build it over the long, long haul, and you've got to put in place a platform that gives those players a chance to, over time to improve, identify, um, nurture more in the British League, a stronger British League, and ultimately leading to an improving status. Now you can do that with the right CEO, with the right infrastructure, England and GB combined. Right now, I say there is a chance to make it work, GB in England, I would say the way to make that work is have a bonfire of the leadership of Basketball England and go out and recruit a chair and a chief executive and key support staff to run both brands, GB and England, um, with fresh eyes. That's not me, because people will see me as tainted from you know, the, the, the battle that I fought in the rear guard action, but there will be people out there who can do a socking great job and a much better job than seems to be being done at the moment. Three months in, looked like three wasted months to me. 
you you touched upon commercial income then um you know british basketball is at over 15 million now since since its inception uh does it not shock you disappoint you that there really is no commercial income they haven't been able to raise any significant commercial income over the years um you know surely there should be someone held to account for that um you know what, what's your assessment of that situation i think it's terribly disappointing uh very sad for the sport um and yeah, you know, the government made a big effort ahead of 2012 and yeah they it made a mess of the british basketball initiative for london 2012 i mean didn't really make of that opportunity what it might have done commercially but also from a performance perspective um i think the great sadness for me is that a sport that is so vibrant has such natural appeal globally um is so huge british kids interest in nba is so enormous um at a commercial level a professional level here is so modest so i look at i went to a couple of um bbl matches just you know in my brief tenure and um great fun to watch but modest crowds and you got to look at it and say you know 1500 people a thousand people watching a match in london in a copper box is, is that all the sport can manage and it's not i'm not that's not a reflection on the london lions per se it's a reflection of the whole league the whole sport kevin routledge you know, a man clearly who cares passionately about sport doesn't always get on with all the other owners and vice versa and like any league um we've got premier league football premiership rugby you know everybody falls out with everybody all the time but collectively the crowds aren't big enough um as a consequence that collectively the commercial income isn't strong enough so for me a relationship a strong relationship with the league is essential um how can you together package and sell and capture the imagination of the public and sponsors for this sport and at the same time you've got um that sort of summer you know premier basketball initiative that's been talked about for years bumbling around um let's hope something can be made of that don't know but if it, something is made of it then how does that sit with the league so there's all these different players sort of chipping in around the edges um and who is sitting down and for the good of the sport saying let's stop squabbling with each other what we're up against here is kids playing FIFA and League of Legends um, in their sitting rooms. We're up against um, bouldering, which is an Olympic sport. Next time round, we're up against skateboarding. We're up against um, some other conventional sports. Uh, where's our share of voice? Where's our share of the airtime with young people? Um, we're being squeezed by looking inwardly and fretting about each other. Um, a second franchise for London in the BBL. I, I don't know a lot about the detail. I'm now outside looking in, thinking, well, if they're only getting that smaller crowd in the copper box, how would a second London franchise work? Can you really make that a success? Who is stepping back saying, what we need is 10,000 people watching our London team? Where should it be? How do we publicise that? How do we make that really sexy from a marketing perspective? Um, how do we capture attention? Having a team at Crystal Palace and a team in the copper box and you know, let's say they each gather a few hundred fans for every match economically won't work and so any good player will not want to play there how, how do you make the maths work did you um have any conversations with uh potential sponsors like when when you were in the position uh i assume you have relationships from previous sports you've been involved with and did you have any conversation with brands and kind of get their get a gauge from them um what they're thinking about basketball i, I spoke to two agencies um both of whom were very well connected and interestingly, um, both were what really what they really wanted was three on three. Um, that for them was where the brand appeal was: outdoor, fast, very urban. You could dress it up in a sort of unconventional sporting way mm -hmm. to sell it. Um, and they saw much more in the way of sort of human stories that they could build on a sort of you know, eight something edgy um and for both independently it wasn't me going to say would you like some of this it was more them instantly feeding back they knew about this they'd done some research on it they thought there were ways in which it could be packaged i also spoke to a third agency based overseas that are looking at the format of basketball and you know for them three on three also was 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 where the real appeal was um the core conventional sport um wasn't instantly 
flicking the light switch. And I think the reason for that was not they look at the NBA and say that's uninteresting. It's that they look at British professional basketball and say it's been tried for a long time and hasn't broken through. So what would change that now? Whereas the new form, newer format of the sport, which is not particularly well known in Great Britain, they saw as more of a blank canvas that they could paint pictures on that that did things for their brand. So, and the BBF um, in seven weeks, I was never going to get to this, but has yet to make anything of the opportunity that comes from that format of the sport being an Olympic format now, um, Commonwealth Games format. Uh, and what are we What are we doing about that um, in Great Britain? How can we make something of that? And, yeah, that's a conversation that has to happen. I can't see where it's happening. Yeah, no, I'd agree. So uh, there's definitely <clears throat> not a lot being done on the three on three front. I think um, Julius Joseph, who runs Ball Out and Outdoor three on three tournament, which kind of the big, become the biggest sort of national three on three, is definitely leading leading the way on that. But there seems to be, um, yeah, definitely a lacking strategy on the on the side of the federation uh, administration, whether it's the home nations or or the BBF. Yeah. Um, and I think often often in these things, Sam. Um, Less is more, and in you know, core conventional professional basketball, are there too many teams? Yeah, what might it be like if you had? I'll make a number up, okay? So, just to make a point, what if there were eight or ten, or six or eight? Um, what if you had some agglomeration? What if you tried to really create sort of deep centers of fan sentiment and support? Um, and we're spread so thinly at the moment. Um, yeah, I live in um, I live in Sussex. It'd probably take me half an hour to go and see Guildford play, which is due north of me. Um, what's gonna What's gonna pull me that way? Um, and no, I've been involved, so I probably will go along a few times this year, just because I've now seen it and had a bit of a taste for it. But what's gonna pull the casual sports fan mm. into into Guildford? Um, and I look across the piece and think it, some of this is too esoteric geographically. Um, yeah, you've got to pick the big cities and say what can we really do to nail it and get um, and people. it's classic in sport, people are always harking back to don't you remember when there were that many people in Manchester watching you know, blah, blah, blah. I've, I've heard it in athletics, I've heard it in all sorts of other sports um, that was yesterday, that was the day before Playstation and you know, PS2 and whatever, whatever it's a new environment here where are the centres of concentration of people playing the sport at grassroots how can you give them something to identify with? And maybe there are too many entrepreneurs owning too many teams trying to make a living out of it at the top level and possibly if you boil it down to a smaller, punchier league. Um, and maybe some as a part of that, I don't know. Maybe more European competitions are part of it, whatever it might be, but the right people need to be in the room and leave aside some of their inbuilt um, self-interest to talk about the good of the sport. Certainly when I dealt with the BBL, um, Enjoyed dealing with Kevin, had a million conversations with him in a short period of time. Um, but I'd pick up vibe from other teams that were sort of, you know, the internecine warfare within the BBL as well. You'd say, okay, yeah, who's stepping back from this saying, what does this sport need mm. if it's going to thrive? And you, yeah, I spoke to one, I won't name him, former um, British star of the sport. And um, he had lots of things to say about what was wrong with it. But if you asked him, yeah, what was his offer to be a part of a solution, didn't want anything to do with being a part of a solution because you know, he'd been too worn down over the years by you know, having ideas and having them batted back. And, and I think that's yeah, it's very telling. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I had this conversation with a few friends recently about you know, the, the people that are best placed, um, in my opinion, to help lead the sport forward are the ones that want nothing to do with the administration because it's just, I guess it's just got such bad branding and such a bad rep and they've had such bad interactions with it yeah. um, it's never going to happen uh, look for me I, I think you're absolutely right And that, that, in UK athletics there are times when over a couple of beers with board colleagues you say yeah, what's the best you can ever hope to achieve as the governing body for athletics and my cynical line was not to be hated too much um, because people will always hate the governing body. They yeah. always hate the governing body. You know, what did the Romans ever do for us? You know, the old Monty Python sketch. You know, well, they did the aqueducts oh, yeah, and the roads. Yeah, and everything. Yeah. Sanitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what, what have they ever done for us? <laughs> You'll always get that as a governing body. And then, so there will be people who want nothing to do with the governing body because they don't want to be up against that. Yeah. What can you do for us? So for me, my starting point would be what can you do for British teams to, on whatever budget you've got, to deliver excellence within the budget. 
then what can I do to improve that budget, which is commercial or membership fees or whatever it might be, um, cost cutting, you know, are we doing it efficiently, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, Mark Clark, to my mind, fought a pretty lone battle as you know, your performance man on the board of the BBF up against it, hardly any cash to, to squeeze what he could out uh, of support for the teams to to help them be the best they could be on court. And I'd want to turn all of that on, on its head and say rather than one guy running around sort of trying to rub two pennies together to make something happen, at, at different levels of spending, what would you get in supporting those teams? Mm. Uh, and what's a must have, what's a really nice to have, what's a be really good if we could have that as well, levels of service, call them bronze, silver, gold, or whatever you want to do it. And, and let's try and let's try and make that work. So actually, when a British player flies back to Spain after a match, hopefully he's won, you don't know, whatever, it's sport, isn't it? Um, and he's comparing his experience with his counterparts from other nations who are playing in the same professional team as him there, he comes away thinking, well, you know what, I might think they're a bunch of toe rags at the BBF and you know, no one likes the governing body and whatever, but actually, when I look at it, they've done all right by me. You know, the sports science support was good. Um, the logistics work well. I got some pretty good. We got some pretty good coaching. Um, our game time experience matched up to what I see elsewhere. Not all of that's that expensive, but it's about imagination, excellent people mm. who care about sport and know it. You couldn't ask me to be a performance director. Of course, you couldn't in any sport. Um, you can ask me to how to run the numbers, um, but finding the right people that, that that understand what excellence is all about. Um, now, the one great thing that's been done in the new regime, um, there's an athletics coach who I fell out with any number of times, very publicly, Tony Minicello, who's joined the board of the BBF. Yeah. The one thing I'll say about, I'll say lots of great things about Tony, and also he can be a pain in the backside, and has been for me a few times, but um, he understands excellence. You know, Jessica Ennis Hill didn't get where she is today without Tony Minicello at her side from the age of 13, 14, all the way through to multi-gold medals. He knows about no compromise. He knows about that little, all those attention to detail that enable you to peak at the right time. And I'm hoping for the sake of basketball that that, from another sport, but at the very highest level, that sort of dispassionate observation of what, what's, what great is like will be helpful. It won't make the British basketball teams great tomorrow, but hopefully over time they will get better because someone in there with an outsider's perspective would be challenging the system to say can't we do it better can't we do it differently so I think that's a good appointment um, but it's only going to work if there's some money behind it and yeah the Mark Clarks of this world um, are given the requisite support but environmental culture if you like that says this isn't about uh, living a hand-to-mouth existence it's about a plan that lasts over many cycles um, what is required and I don't think anyone has had any opportunity to have those conversations for, for far too long, if ever, at, at GB basketball level. So with all of the directors having resigned, independent directors, and obviously you having resigned, is the, uh, well, and then obviously Lisa's left now as well. I mean, um, that was bound to happen. Uh, yeah. She was a sitting duck pretty much from the moment that ha the, the takeover happened. Yeah, yeah. Is the, um, the disagreement uh, the the fighting the infighting between the BBF and the home nation is completely over now. Like, is anyone still yeah, fighting no, in the corner no, from the people that no, resigned? There's, 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 you know, the BBF now consists of Nick the home Shaw, nations Steph, um, and two independent directors. One of Tony that we just discussed. I think the other's a Scottish lawyer. I don't know, but I, I may have got his profession wrong. Um, so all the GB teams are is a product line for Basketball England, effectively, um, presumably to be delivered at the lowest possible cost. Uh, because where's the money coming for, from them? Um, it doesn't look very sponsorable, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, Sport England may be putting some money in. If they are, they've not told anybody, but hopefully they are. Um, there is a new um, fund called the Aspiration Fund, which was announced a week or so ago. Um, three million pounds over two years, so only one and a half million a year, leading up to Tokyo 2020 Olympics and Paralympics. And all the unfunded sports have got a chance to bid into that up to 500,000 of that right yeah, and unfortunately so yeah absolutely unfortunately when I look at the criteria I don't think basketball features very highly up the rankings of sports that might get that money because there are other sports we talked about wheelchair rugby earlier yeah. that are much closer to being in Tokyo 
and possibly even squeezing onto the podium in Tokyo. Whereas I think we'd all have to be honest with ourselves and say it's a long shot for GB men or women to make Tokyo. The women might get a slightly higher chance than the men. But if you're putting money in because it's about aspiring to Tokyo, I think basketball's quite a way down the list of, of people with their hat out looking for some money to be tipped in. Might happen, I hope it does. Um, but you can't put your hands on your heart and say they're top of the list or near the top of the list. However much we think from a societal perspective they deserve to be, and I think they do, but actually if the criteria is about aspiring to the podium or even just to being in Tokyo, it's a tough call. So where's the money coming from? So no one's fighting GB Corner because GB is just now the home nations with no two independent directors who've been chosen by the home nations. So, you know, yeah. they know why they're there. Um, so who's going to shout? I can't see it happening. And I think that's, again, it's just profoundly sad. One final thing I did want to touch upon um, before we wrap up, because we're coming up to about an hour. Um, the media coverage stuff. Uh, you know, you're used to, well, athletics obviously gets plenty of media coverage, when, when, especially when they've got major championships going on. Um, were you surprised with uh, how little mainstream coverage it, it was like how difficult was it to get mainstream coverage for anything from a basketball standpoint um, and why do you think there there is such a barrier uh, for basketball to get mainstream media coverage it's not just basketball it's lots of sports Sam and athletics we had to fight like crazy during the season to get our column inches thankfully we had some medal winners and so national attention Olympics world championships and so on so we, we feed off that you haven't got that in basketball um, there's, there's two unstoppable forces in the media sports media at the moment one is football and so it, and I'm a big football fan I chair the, the foundation for Crystal Palace as I said earlier um, but I don't see why you need to send three reporters if you're the Guardian to Chelsea Man United um, I don't need a colour piece as well as a, an interview with the manager's piece as well as a match report I just need the match report tell me everything in the match report but you get pages rather than one page <laughs> Yeah. so football is, is unstoppable and it's understandable why and the other, which, is, which I applaud this trend, but it is taking column inches, is the rise in interest in female sport. So if you look now, you get a lot more on women's football, particularly, but also cricket and rugby. Um, the netball team getting column inches. And these are partly because there is genuinely growing interest in women's team sports um, that are off the back of the already high profile male sports, so rugby, cricket, football. Um, and you know, I, I, you, you can't break that. But also those those women's teams are succeeding. So again, if we had, and clearly it was helpful, the Commonwealth Games from a basketball perspective. Um, but if the British women's basketball team was all conquering, I'm, I can guarantee it would get a lot of column inches because the netball team's getting a lot of column inches. It's winning things. Um, so success is important. And so it doesn't surprise me basketball hasn't got the inches because it hasn't got the success. Um, but all sports are fighting against those two trends. One of them I applaud, the other I is frustrating even though I'm a football fan. Um, if it wasn't for you and Mark Woods, um, you know, basketball would be in a really sorry place because you know, you're at least got your sharp elbows online particularly and you're creating space for the sport which people are engaging with. And I, I absolutely applaud you for that. Um, but the breakthroughs into national media attention are going to rest on either controversy or success now the controversy you know if, if we were looking here at the australian team having that massive dust up you know that i'm not looking for the british team to do that to get national column inches but unfortunately that's the world we're living in um and for for some time basketball is going to have to remain a little bit underground and online um but hopefully over time crowds will build there will be more success if the women's team really succeeds i think that'll be helpful because that is that will tap into that second trend um but everyone's got to everyone's got to work their angles do, do you think uh professional the professional league success is more important than national team success when you talk about basketball penetrating into the into the mainstream culture i think you need national team success people really identify with the british vest in any sport um now look if if the Leicester Riders started to conquer Europe, that, that could become a story. I mean, it would start probably a little bit small in a corner of Great Britain, but it would. The further they went, the more that would build, and people would say, "You're not going to be able to believe this," but 
the British teams going and sticking it to European counterparts for the first time in ever, that that would have some resonance, I think. But ultimately, you know, if Britain got on court and, and was winning, you start with a, a paragraph here and there, but a paragraph's better than no paragraphs, and you build on from there. And you've got to find, you know, if you can find a fantastic role model or two, both genders, um, and someone's got to start building a story around them. Um, but that takes time and money and someone who cares. Um, it's, you know, it's, at UK Athletics, we had a media team that really worked hard building around success. So at the moment, Dina Asher-Smith, the sprinter, is you know, the story in athletics, or Laura Muir, that's um, is the distance runner. So those two, very different women, different backgrounds, um, but both bright, marketable, globally successful, um, but they're getting, let's say their column inches they deserve, um, certainly they're punching up to their weight because a lot of people have spent a lot of time helping them, working out how to do that. And so someone has to do that with the basketball stars of tomorrow in Great Britain and it'll be a long-term project. Um, but it helps Mark Woods can can gather national media column inches, be, but largely it's on the back of his athletics work, but at least he's you know he's got that in. But you've got to give him something to write about. Um, and yeah, people have got to give you um, a platform for your stories to then gain online resonance beyond the core basketball audience. And that, that's going to be about success. It's going to be about stars. Um, it's going to be about people with personality. Um, it's all doable. It just takes time. Yeah. Okay, so a final question. Uh, what do you see for the future of British basketball? Let's wrap it up uh, with kind of your, your vision for the future of, of British basketball. Well, I think it will be or what I'd like it to be. What you think it will be? Unfortunately, I think it's going to be a stubborn rearguard resistance from the leadership of Basketball England um, to moving aside, uh, to being replaced by people with um, apolitical um, and with the interest of sport at heart to take it forwards. Um, I don't know when, I can't remember when Claire Wardle's um, term of office is up. That's a great opportunity to try and make change, but all efforts to make change from within the Basketball England board have completely failed. Um, we all saw the attempt to call a, you know, to get a motion through the AGM recently, came to nothing. So I think we've got to wait till she's had enough. Um, and hopefully when she's had enough, there'll be some, some imaginative leadership that can be collaborative and, and really take things forward. Now, what would I like it to be? Um, I'd like someone to get in there, um, work really closely with the league, um, work really closely with grassroots clubs and infuse them about the value to the league and to grassroots so all ends of basketball of a GB team that's well organized well supported um, that everybody in the sport can look up to and, and latch onto and say this is helping promote the sport and then it can break out of the gym the school you know, the playground the you know, the backyard whatever it might be and um, and it could be something that you know really builds on the, 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 the genuine passion for the sport that, that is broad in this country and it looks all the way up to the NBA. And at the moment, we've just got this gap between people's interest and appetite and you know, the global professional game and, and where are we in the middle? Nowhere at the moment, but it, it, of course it can be done. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ed, for joining us. It is much appreciated. A pleasure. Thanks, Ed. <laughs>